Today we're talking about the skiing in the early days of the Gunnison country. And I'm going to start off by just a couple of announcements. Uh, number one, uh, Glow already is passing the buttons around. And as I told you last time, April 1, I have a slideshow at the Talk of the Town. And then on April the 3rd, on Friday night, they have the Polka with Pete Dunda over at Maxwell's. So we hope a lot of you, uh, a lot of you can attend. Uh, next week, they have parent-teacher conferences at the school. So we are moving to the library. So we will not be meeting in here. We'll be meeting in the library, which is just down the hall. Upstairs, downstairs. What's that? Upstairs, downstairs. Downstairs. Downstairs library, right down the hall, yeah. And uh, next week we are going to, the topic is going to be water. Of all the things I tell you about in this class, the most important thing and the second place thing would need a telescope to see it is water. And uh, fortunately I got Richard Rosman right here as a backup. If I screw up. He's going he's gonna to nail me. Now, before we get into the slides here, there is a famous song that I'd like to start with, and I'm not going to sing it. I'm just going to go ahead and read it. How many people have ever heard of Super Skier? Nobody. <laughs> well, <laughs> this is going to be a real treat. Well, they called him Super Skiers. He sat around the sun deck and swore that he'd never take a spill. When they finally brought him down, they had to use three toboggans to carry all the pieces down the hill. He was coming down that slope doing 90 miles an hour when he caught an edge of his ski. Well, his clothes, they were fast, but the slopes, they were faster. That's the last of Super Skier we shall see. Well, he hollered, what the hell, as he lined them parallel. He figured there was nothing more to learn, oh no. As he started on his way, he, he shouted, on a lay, assuming that he'd never have to turn. Well, he was slipping down that slope, doing 90 miles an hour, when a mogul flipped him into the air. His jumping form was fine until he ran into that pine, and two one-legged skiers left from there. When he left that tree at last, he was moving twice as fast. Both halves were skimming moguls like a feather. He said, if I must be a split personality, how can I ever keep my knees together? One ski was headed north and the other was headed west, because both of them, you see, were running free. And folks up on Little Nell looked up scared as hell. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's super skier. Now the moral of my story, though my story's kind of gory, for all you Sun Deck Charlies, there's still hope. You buy the fastest clothes you can, then talk skiing like a man, but don't let people catch you on the slope. Chad Mitchell Trio, big song. Anybody tell me the most famous member of the Chad Mitchell Trio? John Denver. John Denver. Today, folks, we're going to take a look at the, uh, the earliest days of skiing. And I've got 80 slides here. And what I'm going to do is maybe introduce this a little bit later. Let's go ahead and do the slides right now, if you guys wouldn't mind. All right, here we go, everybody. This is skiing in Crested Butte in 1880. You can see the size of the skis, as I told you before, 9 to 14 feet. They have a seven-foot-long guide pole, and that is used in the telemark turn, and that's used for balance. And also, when you're going real fast and you need to stop, you drag that thing between your legs. This is up at Mount Sneffels, not far from Uray, and these are guys that are drinking on a Sunday. And that's a really interesting shot because, as you'll notice, some guys are on skis, then called snowshoes, and some guys are on Canadian webs, which are snowshoes today. So you kind of get a little of both. These are people at Crystal, Colorado, walking up a hill, and in the back of the photograph it said that 
They had an avalanche there the previous day, so everybody knew it wouldn't avalanche again, so they're skiing on top of the avalanche. Little girl named Esther in marble, 1906. Notice the skis, notice the shoes. Not very much opera ski. Here's a little boy up Ohio Creek in the Gunnison country. Look at the size of those skis. And you can see that that kid has not moved very much because that dog is bored stiff. <laughs> now you get a sense of the length of the skis. Remember what I told you last time? They used to boil the tips of those skis in the, in the camp kettles. And that would allow them to turn them up. And the reason they were so long was that if they weren't that long, they said they would break. They would need to glide over the snow. Now, that woman's probably about 5'4", and those skis are more than double her height. This is at a place called Animus Forks near Silverton. And they had so much snow in 1913 that the telegraph wires were covered. Snowshoe Express in the Crested Butte Taylor Park area. You got a toboggan pulled by a horse with supplies on top of the toboggan and a guy right in the back. And on the back of that photograph it said, Brown is the name of the guy. He says, uh, would Brown get off the side of the trail? No, they said Brown is too smart for that. Because if you got off the trail, you'd go right up into your waist in heavy snow. So you tried to hit that same trail all the time. Mr. and Mrs. Bergman at a town called North Star, which is near White Pine, not far from before you start the ascent of Monarch Pass. Cabin, you know, didn't have any central heating in those days. I love this shot and I'll read it to you. This is Crested Butte, 1907, April. Ready to start snowshoeing. This is before as I have labeled. I wish I had a picture of after. You would not have recognized them as the same party. Evidently, a very difficult day skiing. But there they are in Crested Butte, April 1907, 108 years ago, back from skiing. There is Smith Hill. That is as far as the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad ever ran north of Crested Butte, about four miles up the Slate River. The locals today call that Cloud City. When we get finished with the slideshow, I'm going to talk to you about anthracite. The name of the mine on top of that hill is called Smith Hill. And the breaker is anthracite. And that tram you see on the right ran 1,600 feet from the top of Smith Hill down to the breaker. More about that in a moment. And then uh, when the coal, anthracite coal, was broken up into different sizes, it was loaded on the Denver and Rio Grande and taken out. Crested Butte Depot, 1886. Narrow gauge railroad arriving. Nine mile an hour average speed. I've already told you stories about the railroad and the slowness of the railroad. 154 coke ovens of Crested Butte. Now you can see that the railroad has tracks, and you can see the railroad car on the right. And what they did was shovel bituminous coal into those ovens, get it red hot, cook for 24 hours. When it cooled, some guys with pitchforks took it out and put it into the railroad car to be shipped to the CF&I steel mills in Pueblo where it and lime from Monarch Pass was used in the production of steel. Henry Bessemer's blast furnace. 
The worst job in all of Crested Butte was tending those coke ovens. And whoever was the last guy off the boat got the job. And I know how hot I used to work blacktopping on a highway one summer, and I mean, that's brutal. And those coke ovens are just like that. There is the main drag of Crested Butte, 1884, with the famous Elk Mountain House about where Donita's is today on the left. Dirt Road. Anybody, how many people in here can tell me when they paved Elk Avenue in Crested Butte? 1974. So it only took them 90 years. Jokerville coal mine explosion. That is a picture taken out of Scribner's, or Harper's Weekly, I should say. Killed 60 people. Glow, incidentally. Well, I got you. Remember I told you I thought there was a big marker put up in honor of the Jokerville? And I don't think anybody's ever seen it. I got a picture of it. I don't know where it is, but you and I are going to look for it. And it's big. It's five, six feet high, made out of steel. But there it is. That's right after the coal mining disaster caused by seeping methane gas, January 24th, 1884. Well, the Jokerville, if you head out of Crested Butte to the left, just before you get up the hill, that first hill there, somewhere on the left, the vein actually tied into the big mine, so just west of Crested Butte, but not far out of town. There's the DNR G268 right in front of the depot. That's the one that is in front of the Gunnison Museum today. Narrow gauge. How far apart are those narrow gauge tracks? Three feet. Four engines in the roundhouse at Cimarron. The item they have in the front is known as a cow catcher. And the reason they put it on the front is when cows got on the train, you know, cows are not stupid. Despite my years on the farm when I would beg to differ, <laughs> cows will always go for the best grass. And if the best grass is growing right along a railroad track, that's where they're going. And that's where the best grass was because when the, grain kick, the train kicked out a little water, the grass grew. So if you hit that cow and it gets under the wheels, it'll throw the train off the track. What this thing did was bump the cows off the track so they couldn't get under the wheels. It's called a cow catcher. The Levita Hotel, Gunnison, the Edgerton House, still standing, and the skating rink, 1884. Peacock among mud hens. Four thirty any afternoon in the summer in the Gunnison country. If Benjamin Franklin had been flying that damn kite, he'd have been electrocuted if he got hit with one of those bursts. First snowmobile in history. Nineteen twenty three stoplight corner Gunnison. Last time I referred to that, I gave you a little quote. It was called a flying sled and had two major problems. Problem number one was with that propeller in the front, uh, when you got on the flat where there was no snow to go through, the damn thing went all over the place. You couldn't control it. And whenever you got in about six inches of snow, it didn't have enough power to go forward. So a great invention went a glimmering. 92 years ago. Oz, uh, Chris Osmondson, G.J. Santelli have that at the Flatiron. This is a woman in 1913 skiing from Sargent's, from uh, White Pine to Sargent's for the railroad connection. Her son 
is in a snowdrift box mounted on top of a sled, and she is skiing out, pulling her son. Pioneer Ski Area, three miles up Cement Creek. First chair left in Colorado. The run on the left is the big one. The big boy is called the Big Dipper. Everything is a fall away turn. Very steep. Opened up during the winter 1939 and 40. Tremendous collegiate races were held there. There is the Pioneer guest cabin that uh, they have today. And there are people lining up to get on the chair to go to the top of the Pioneer ski area. Now this is a great shot. This is not exactly a modern chair. Remember, they made those chairs out of ore buckets initially from the Blistered Horde Mine near Cumberland Pass. And then they had canvas and boards that they used. Now this lady, remember last time I mentioned the Forest Service took one look at how high those chairs were in the fall, and they said, you got to lower the damn things. People fall out of there, they're going to get hurt. And they lowered them, and then 10 feet of snow fell, and people were getting flipped out of the chairs. You can see she's about ready to go out. Western State Hiking and Outing Club, Toboggan, Skis, Quicks Hill. Quicks Hill, as you all know, is right across the road from the entrance to Cement Creek. And a rancher, Mr. and Mrs. Quick, I've never been able to find out his first name. I'm still looking. Great people, hot chocolate coffee for the kids, walk up and toboggan down. Western State Hiking and Outing Club members, students, only students would do this, playing Crack the Whip on skis. Crack the Whip off of skis is dangerous. And you can see the pitch of that hill. We're not talking about on the flat here. No poles, primitive skis, cracking the whip. Rosman Hill opens up, winter 50, 51. Newspaper article said new Rosman Hill ski jump hail is one of the finest. There is the judging stand on the right with all those guys judging. When you're ski jumping, you got two things you're looking for. Number one is distance, but what's even more important is form. Remember I told you last time how far those cars are piled up? This is a slalom run. You can see the uh, judging stand down below. That has nothing to do with the slalom. Cars are piled up almost to Highway 135. And on a lot of the big races, not only were they piled up to the start of Highway 135, they then were on the side of the road on 135. I'll tell you a little story about this. I don't think I've told it. If I have, correct me. All you correct me. My first day in Gunnison was on or about Labor Day, 1962. Never been here before. Didn't know anybody. I tell this story? Nope. And I didn't know anybody, so I said, well, I'm going to go uptown and have a beer. And I walked uptown, and there was a little place called Goads. It's Coach Light today. And it was real small, and it was a picture of a ski jumper above the bar. So I'm talking to the bartender. I say, hey, that looks a little bit like where I come from. He said, oh, where are you from? I said, Michigan. He said, I'm from Michigan, too. And I said, well, I'll end this conversation. I said, well, I'm from the Upper Peninsula. And he said, I'll be damned. He said, I'm from the Upper Peninsula. And then I said, I thought it would eliminate it. I said, well, I'm from near Escanaba. And he said, I'll be Galdarn. He said, I'm from Escanaba. That guy right there, the first guy I ever met in the Gunnison country is from my hometown. That's John Grodeski that used to run the Red Dolly Pub. 
going aloft at Rosman Hill. What are the chances of that happening? Primitive ski patrol bringing in an injured skier at Rosman. You can see Crested Butte Mountain in the background. This is about 1955. Today, I'm going to spend a little moment here. Today, Lindsey Vaughn has won the Super G. 67th victory. Now she has the championship this year in the downhill and the Super G. Greatest woman skier of all time, any country. Beating Anna Maria Pro L62. This guy, in my opinion, was the greatest alpine skier the United States ever had. And here he is at Rosman Hill in 1958. When he went over to Europe before the World Cup even started, he was winning downhill races when no American could ever come close. The only guy that could equal him was a guy named Dick Durrance in the late 30s and the early 40s before the war. Whenever he went back to Europe, he brought back something that gave him his nickname. And every Swede, Norwegian, Italian, German, Austrian desperately wanted a gift from this guy. And it was a cowboy hat. Hence the name, the Steamboat Springs Cowboy. After the 64 Olympic Games were over, he was skiing with Willy Bogner and 15 other people outside of Alsaline, Switzerland. And an avalanche broke away. 13 people were out of the side. Buddy Werner and Barbie Hennenberger, a great downhiller from Germany, were right in the path. And the only thing they could do is try to outrun it. And here are two world-class downhillers and people watching on the chairlift of what was happening. And they outran it, but when they got to the bottom, a huge avalanche was dislodged by the one they had beaten, came in from the side and buried both of them and killed them. They took Buddy Werner's body to Steamboat Springs, whole town turned out, buried him, and from that time on, the mountain in Steamboat Springs is called Mount Werner. The greatest, in my opinion now, with all due respect to Bodie Miller and the Mayer brothers, Mayer brothers, he was doing things that had never been done by an American at that time. Great gentleman, very nice guy. Western Colorado mourned. Pershing Mine Hill, one mile up the lower looper, a little less, right across from Jane Karen O'Neill's house. One of the Crested Butte locals going aloft off the jump. You see the guy, you see the two guys with the hats in the middle, brim hats, the guy next to him on the right, I think is Johnny Somerak. Hands in his pocket right next to the uh, two guys to his left with the brimmed hats. This is one of the greatest exhibitions uh, of skiing I've ever seen. Oz and G.J. have this in the Flatirons. This is Steve Krismanich, better known as Beans, on Pershing Mine Hill. And look at the angulation. Those poles, I ski with those poles, people. They are heavy. And those skis and those bindings are not like we have today. And that is absolutely unbelievable turning. Crested Butte Ski Area for it opened up. They just finished off the warming house on the left. They got the gondola shack still being built. Hardly anybody remembers the bridge. I don't think anybody remembers the pond. A little different today. Everybody is lining up to get in the damn gondola shack. Took 10 minutes to get on top, three people in the gondola. In the late 1960s, a guy named Norm Simmons and Bobby Schweitzer set the world record for runs in one day. 
23, down the downhill or international. And everybody let them get in line. Now remember, it took 10 minutes to go up. So 23 runs is 230 minutes, that's four hours. And then you had to take your, you know, the long thons on and off, and they may still make 23 runs. One of the Malensic barns, that is Jay Miller going off the barn, and Bob Schweitzer on top, ready to come down. The beer stube. Norm Simmons on the left, Don Spicklemeyer, Bob Knowles, and Dick Erickson. Now, now their people is where you used to drink your beer after the skiing was over. And inside, and I don't think I told this story, inside a Western State student named Buck Kelly played the banjo. And there it was said all the beer was cold, the music was hot, and the women were good looking. And Buck Kelly, a good friend of his, came through Gunnison about seven or eight years ago. And I said, did you ever hear from Kelly? He said, yeah, sad story. He said, he died of cancer about eight years ago. But he went on to play all over the world. He was a pilot, I don't know what you call these guys, that fly in between the flags. One of the best in the world. And then Dan Larson, as he left, kind of brought a tear to my eye. He said, you know, Vanna Bush, Kelly always liked you. And he said, I think I liked you because you were the only faculty member that liked his music. And I liked the damn banjo. He was a hell of a player. Every Saturday on the sweep, a ski patrolman named Jack Hudson would come up on the other side of the cabin, snow was piled to the roof, come right up on top of the roof, jump over the people sitting there, and land in a pile of snow next to the parking lot. And you could always hear him as soon as he hit the roof, right around 5 o'clock. There's the warming house. There's the J-Bar cabin. And that is 1963, because you can see one of the gondolas, I think. Well, if that's a gondola, no, I guess you can. 1962, probably. Now you can see a gondola going out the right side there. So this is very early, 63 or 64. I always thought it was a bad mistake to tear down that warming house. This is what we used to call a tip stand. Anybody remember those? Three women from Steamboat Springs, 1920. Now, as Bob Dylan said, the times, they are a-changing, because you'll notice the three women on the left have guide poles, and the woman on the right has got two baskets, two poles. Times are changing. Shooting rabbits right where the Crested or the Gunnison Airport is today, 1924. Bill Calkins, who used to run a florist shop, is right in the middle. And the railroad roundhouse is on the left. Crested Butte Town Band, 1900. I love this shot because the guy on the left with the big tuba, if that isn't John Belushi right out of Blues Brothers, <laughs> I never saw him. And the guy in the middle there looks a hit man out, like a hitman out of New Jersey. In fact, I told him this, he looks a little like Dave Leinsdorf. Marshall Pass Ski Train, February 13, 1938. 417 people from Salida, 122 from Gunnison, 117 riding the regular train, meeting on top of Marshall Pass, and skiing down the west side to the third switch. 
Thor Groswald and Count Dupuy giving lessons on top. And a lot of people brought their toboggans. See the train on the left. Now remember the guy I told you about last time, people, Carl Easterly? We all remember Carl. We gave him a round of applause last time. Here he is in action. 1938, Quicks Hill, doing a backflip on skis long before anybody ever did it. Here he is at Sun Valley, Idaho, 1947, with his brother Verl being pulled by an ancient helicopter at 50 miles an hour for an early TV show. You see the guys filming on the right. They did a flip over the fence. Verl fell on the first run, didn't want to do the second. Carl fell in the pond on the first try because he told me that he thought there'd be a lot more friction than there wasn't. And he said he damn near froze to death while they thawed him out. But he now is in the pond at 50 miles an hour on alpine skis, and he makes it. And now out of the uh, pond he comes, and he does a backflip over a wooden fence. And I would suggest again that we give him another round of applause. <laughs> the best of them all. Is Faust here? Where are you, Faust? Would you say this guy's a good man? Thank you. Here is the famous gun barrel run at Monarch. And you can see the cabin on the left. And a rope tow ran up about halfway for a while and then went all the way to the top. Very steep run, got to walk to it. It's a great run, great fall line. Sven Wick and the Western States Ski Team, 1952 at Rosman Hill. Sven Wick on the left, two-time Olympic coach, father of Nordic skiing in the U.S., celebrated birthday number 94 at Steamboat Springs two weeks ago, skis four kilometers every two days. Right over Sven's right shoulder, it says, tow tickets, $1. There's Vail Pass. I want you people to look at it. And you say, say, what the hell do you mean that's Vail Pass? How can Gunnison be 42 one way and Salida 23 the other? Here's the story, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> when they built Marshall Pass was the railroad route right parallel to this, 500 feet lower. And every local wanted Marshall Pass to be the automobile road. But Charlie Vail was the highway commissioner, and he was an arrogant bastard who couldn't get along with anybody, and he chose Monarch. And then the bastard tried to name it after himself. But unfortunately, after one week of local people throwing Vail Pass into the ditch, they had to give it up. And they named it what everybody had always known it as, was Monarch Pass. And then he got Vail Pass named for him between Copper Mountain and the Vail area. That's a very rare picture. <coughs> Chicken Ranch, Crested Butte, 1935. <coughs> Excuse me. That is one mile up the Slate River. And the locals skied there and they built little jumps, as you can see. Every weekend they'd be out skiing on the Chicken Ranch, named for the sage hens in the area. Love this shot, taken by Sandy Hickok. 1968. I think 67, actually, Sandy told me. Frank and Gals, one of the great bars in history of Crested Butte. Armistice Day, 1967. On the left, Emil Lunk, Germany. 
Next to him, Frank Hodgson, England, standing Tony Danny, U.S. Army. Next to him, Johnny Panyon, Austro-Hungarian Army. And next to him, Ralph Falsetto, Italian Army. Everyone was trying to kill each other 50 years earlier, and now they're drinking a beer at Frank and Gals. Sandy did an unbelievable service for the town in getting all those pictures that appear in the museum. Hoot Gibson, John Gibson, going aloft on the Pershing Mine Hill. Now, if you look at this picture, people, one, two, three, four from the right, that is Johnny Samarak. Hands on his hips. Crested Butte Ski Club with Lyle McNeil, Glenn Songer, uh, Rudy Verju, all got together and uh, helped build that hill. Jump and a rope toe, early 50s. There's Western State Ski Team again with about three Olympians on the team. Nineteen seventy two skiing off of Monument and looking down at a less than developed it is today, Crested Butte, Mount Crested Butte. You'll love this one. There's the ski patrol. Look at the hair. Now, some of these guys you remember. Second from the left, Charlie Pulsinelli. Right in the middle, back row, Jeff Schneider. Tra what's Tracy's last name? Yeah, Wicklands, third from the right. Uh, on the bottom, Ron Kovanek, the uh, head of the ski patrol, is in the middle. And the guy on the left is Eric Lamb. Jerry Reese, right bottom? Who's top left? Oh, Woody Sherwood, yeah. Anybody else know people? Top right is who? Ah, who's the guy with the glasses that used to be the avalanche guy? Should know him. Danny Ewert, maybe. Yeah, Danny Ewert. Look at all that long hair. There is Frank and Gal's bar. Frank Starica back of the bar. The guy with the beard is Tommy Sneller. That's a place to be. I had a girl named Cindy from Louisville play the accordion. The polkas were unbelievable. Uh, Jenkins, where are you? Raise your hand and say something. There you go. Her father, Leo Klinker, on the day that closed. Grab Gal Starica. About 1975, we cleared all the glasses off the bar, and Clinker and Gal Starica danced the beer barrel polka on that narrow bar, never missed a step with everybody with their arms out, hoping to catch them when they fell, and both of them had a couple of drinks. The winner, 1951-52, St. Patrick's Church. That's when we used to get a little snow around here. Is that 61, 62? Yeah, 61, 62. Look at that snow. January 1952. The only way to get into the business establishments is through a tunnel. All the cars pretty much are up on blocks. I don't know what that guy's doing out on the right because the roads really weren't plowed very well. Skiing over East Maroon Pass, about 1974. We had about 10 inches of snow, and I think I'm breaking trail on that spot, but other guys are in behind me and helping break too. We always do that every year, and it's just fantastic. Camp Hale, located off Tennessee Pass and the home of the 10th Mountain Ski Division, World War II. When they got two days off on the weekend, they used to go to Aspen, sleep on the floor of the Hotel Jerome, and say they never got cold because they drank 
a chocolate malt spiked with five shots of bourbon known as Aspen Crud. <laughs> and they had a great song. I know Glow has heard this before. There are systems and theories of skiing, but one thing I surely have found, skiing's just good in the winter, but the drinking's good all year around. Robel Strobauer, the second ski school director. Sven Wick was number one. Now, a lot of you know Shirley, and some of you know his grandson was in the Olympic Games and got seventh, Aaron Blunk. It's Robel's grandson. Princess Theater, 1930s, tunneling in. Now, I'll tell you why that's a good shot. This is called Bank Night. A guy named Charlie Yeager from Montrose in 1932 decided that because Tuesday night hardly anybody came to the movies, he would have Bank Night. And when everybody got their ticket, at intermission there would be a drawing. And you could win a lot of money based on how many people attended, and you might win about 20 bucks. And pretty soon, everybody came to the movies on Tuesday night for bank night. And Charlie Yeager patented this nationwide and died a multi-millionaire. Chair one, Aspen, Colorado, 1947. How many people in this room have ridden chair one? Anybody? You're looking at one. In the early 60s, you would ride chair one with a blanket over your feet. Now, once you get a good look at Aspen, because in 1947, there are entire blocks with nothing on them, and a lot of the other blocks have only a few buildings on them, and you could have bought the whole block for $50,000 or less in 1947. One of the great ski mountains in the United States. One of the people who works there hit it right on the nose. It's a small mountain, but it skis big, and it does. Ajax. Crescent Ski Patrol, late 60s, left to right, Jeff Jacobson, John Burns, Mike Zaradka, Walt Fricke, George Sibley, Don Bachman, and Billy Schweitzer. I'm going to talk about this a little later. This is off Tower 7. Unbelievable things happened on Tower 7. This is a minor one. Wait till I tell you about some of the other things that happened. Big crowds. And I was there one day to watch history in operation. Crested Butte Community School, 1881. Go Rock Schoolhouse. The largest coal breaker west of Connellsville, Pennsylvania. Floresta. Five stories high, breaking coal up into different sizes, and then the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad taking it out. Built for $100,000 in 1898. Crested Butte, about 1962. Dirt Road, building's not in great shape. Everybody thinks it's going to become a ghost town. Little did they know. One of the greatest people the Crested Butte ever has, ski patrol, that's Steve Monfredo. If you go off the top of uh, Keystone, they got a little run there called Fredo's. Steve Monfredo was a world-class mountain climber. He was a tremendous piano player, almost classical. And he was climbing Communist Peak in Russia in 1987. And he got pulmonary edema 
and they got him down to about 14,000 feet. He had a heart attack and died at the age of 37. And they found out in the autopsy he had scarlet fever as a young man. It scarred his heart. They had the memorial at Jerry Reese's place up Cement Creek, and they had about 2,000 people. His best friend was a just-defeated United States Senator from Colorado, Mark Udall, who was on the trip with Manfredo when he died. Great guy. Now there, I told you about that. That's Phoenix Bowl. You see all those ski patrolmen up above? Vanden Bush has just told them, I want to get a bunch of pictures, fellas, so let me go ahead and ski down to the bottom, and I'll take those shots. They never caught on. <laughs> and, I mean, that's a day where it looks like a foot. I mean, Phoenix Bowl, to me, is the classic run at Crested Butte. None better. Best fall line you could ever get. No bumps in those days. And there aren't too many bumps on it even today. Joe Rosman Sawmill at the end of Elk Avenue. This is what the Keystone Mine tailings looked like before the treatment plant was put in. All that yellowy goo flowed right into Coal Creek, which is the town's water supply. And that treatment plant done a hell of a job in cleaning it up. There is the ore bucket, the first Lodge built in the town of Crested Butte, 1962. Paul Johnston owned it. I was in Vail two years ago to give a talk. I went over. Paul owns a real nice place in Vail. And I went over to say hi, and they said, well, unfortunately, probably not going to know you. He's got Alzheimer's. So still alive, but not doing well. The avalanches never sleep. A Texas boy and his brother were in the parking lot ready to go back to Texas. That avalanche gave way near the Three Seasons and killed them right in the parking lot. That's why they got those big fences up above today. Tony Capuchin serving beer at Tony's Tavern, now known as the Wooden Nickel. He's the guy who told Dick Eflin, when Eflin said, God, the scenery's fantastic around here, and Tony said, you can't live on scenery. <laughs> I think that's the last one. That is uh, New Year's Eve, 1968. I'm at a polka party at the warming house. I don't know how I got lucky, but I walked outside and took that shot, and it's one of my very favorites. Oh, there's the last shot. And that one is the Flauschink, King and Queen, and the first Flauschink, 1969. One of my great friends who was on the beaches of Normandy on D-Day, Whitey Sporsich on the left and Kathy Wirtz on the right. 1969. And that will do it. We have the lights. Thank you. All right, folks, we've got about uh, 20 minutes or so left. I wanted to finish off on the slideshow and the ski area. Some of these things I kind of left off with last time when I was talking to you about it. Uh, Crested Butte, to me, has always been on the cutting edge of the ski industry. Uh, whenever the Galande jumping was in vogue, we had the best. Whenever Olympic skiers came out of the collegiate ranks, we had the best. Whenever people began to do flips, we had the best. Still do. And I got a couple of stories that I want to tell you about the area after it opened in the 1960s. Uh, some of you people may have heard of the famous Flying Bambini Brothers. How many people have heard of the Flying Bambini Brothers? 
led by Roger Ram, Jed Evans, Rick Wood, Tony Nipa, Brian Fasano, and Mike Grazier. And three guys from Steamboat. Going off the T-bar, and they got that big dip on the left side of the T-bar as you're looking down, and these guys were holding hands. Went down to the bottom, came up on the lip, still holding hands, did a backflip, still holding hands, and landed, still holding hands. And he got a picture of that. And it's hard to tell if they're up or down unless you look at the buildings. One of the greatest pictures you ever want to see. The Flying Bambini Brothers. I got to ask Grazier. Grazier's in, I think, Salt Lake. I got to talk to him and find out how they got that word Bambini. Galande jumping. They did Galande jumping off of Tower 7, off of Horseshoe, and also right about where Three Seasons is and a big ski jump. And Galande involved guys on alpine skis in a tuck position going as far down the hill as they could. The world record held by Gunnison boy named Paul Hitchcock, 229 feet in a tuck position with alpine skis. These guys are unbelievable. They also did it off the side of Houston. And I've got unbelievable pictures off of Horseshoe. Fortunately, I had a moving camera. We got it on tape now. A good friend of mine, we took all kinds of pictures 50 years ago. I don't take hardly any today, but then we took a lot of them. Mike Grazier. Anybody met Michael Grazier? Got a few people. Michael Grazier in 1973. They are jumping off of Tower 7. You know, that, Tower 7's where the gondola, where well, it's the same chair today, you know, when you come up right where the T-bar's right on your right, that hill on the left, that's Tower 7. And I was working a uh, junior race, just timekeeping for Ron Barr, junior race on the uh, T-bar, and I came over and I was going to watch some of the jumping, and I had my camera all set, and a guy started to come down, and I thought, well, I'm not, probably not going to get it real good, so I'll wait till the next guy. Big mistake. <laughs> Michael Grazier did the first successful triple backflip in history. And Mike told me that he almost, he, he probably almost could have done four, and he almost wiped out because he was almost in the process of doing another one when he landed. And that Tower 7 hill, of course, shot you right up in the air. And these guys were up, I don't know how far they were up, I'd say 35 or 40 feet in the air. You know, you look at those kids today on those half pipes, and they go 25 feet. I had a great friend named Mike Majeka, who was a great downhill racer for Western State. He's at the Salt Lake City Olympics, and he said, yeah, I never had any respect for these kids, you know, do, hey dude and all that in the half pipes. And then he said he thought he'd go ahead and ski in the half pipe. <laughs> he said when he came out of that half pipe, he had a lot of respect for those kids. <laughs> the damn thing is a skating rink. And uh, mo most of you people know Aaron Blanc. I, unfortunately, I got a picture of myself and Aaron. He's a famous guy. As soon as I bring my camera and it gets light, I'm going to get a picture of Faust here also with me. <laughs> and here's Faust. I'm going, to, I'm going to say this. I was going to talk to you, but you, around that girl's your girlfriend, she tells me. <laughs> good. She gave you a good recommendation. I want you, before I come, you come to class next time, to write up a little biography for me. Can you do that for me? Sure. I'm, ser I'm serious. A little biography for me, and, and along with... No, no, along with some of your achievements. I want that. That's personal favor you to me. Got it? So Michael Grazier, uh, Flauschink celebrations. <laughs> I'll tell you the classic story. We had a medical doctor named Ron Meyer. How many of you remember Ron? Just passed away a few years ago. Don Carroll owned Carroll Shoe Stores in Gunnison. And we had about four or five other college professors, and we're all involved in skiing on Flauschink. And uh, we're drinking some wine and drinking some beer. We got little parties going on all over the mountain. That's the only time I've ever had even a beer 
while I'm skiing. I don't drink when I'm driving or skiing, and I'm about a one beer a week guy anyway. But in this case, we probably had a little more than enough. So we get to the top of the hill overlooking the uh, lodge down below. You know, just you can see the people down below. And Neil Edstrom, who is the snow ranger in charge of the Crested Butte ski area, says to the group, and we must add about 20, he said, let's do the Aspen Shuffle. And everybody said, what the hell is the Aspen Shuffle? He says, I'm going to start off going downhill with a little snow plow, and the next person's got their arms around my waist, and 20 of us are going to do that, and we're going to snake dance down to the bottom. Well, we got about 100 feet, and it just broke up, and everybody fell. And one of my good friends down below is listening to people talking. They saw that. And one guy said to my friend, and pardon the ladies for my language, goddamn drunken college kids. <laughs> there wasn't one college kid amongst them. <laughs> Medical doctor, college professors, shoe store owners. <laughs> Those were the days, my friend. We thought they'd never end. And there's a lot of other great stories that we'll have to wait till later on. Some I probably can't tell, um, but you get the idea. Anthracite, owned by Rick Devine today. Now, I showed you the slide where the railroad, Denver Rail Ra Grand Railroad, ran four miles up the Slate River to Anthracite, and it dead-ended. That's as far north as the Denver and Rio Grand Railroad ever ran. That mine initially was owned by the Jennings brothers. It wasn't a mine, it was just a coal deposit. And it was bought out by the, one of the town fathers of Crested Butte that we talked about last time, Howard Smith. Hence the name Smith Hill. And then Smith, about six years later, sold it to the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company. The coal mine and where the people lived is called Smith Hill. That's the top of the hill. The area down below where the tram ran and put the coal to the tipple and then loaded it onto a railroad car, that is called anthracite. Today, the people refer to the whole area as Cloud City. And some of the locals referred to it as Cloud City back then because they said it was such high elevation. Now, out by Irwin, they got clouds that always appeared midday, Leadville. Almost anywhere in the mountains, very rarely do you get a day where there's some cloud doesn't appear somewhere. Hence the name White Cloud or Cloud City. The coal breaker that was at anthracite was the only coal breaker, only anthracite coal breaker west of Connellsville, Pennsylvania, outside, later on, of Floresta. But the Floresta breaker wasn't built until after the anthracite breaker was built. So until Floresta, this is the only anthracite coal breaker in the U.S. west of Connellsville, Pennsylvania. The tram, the, the hill, incidentally, 1,600 feet from the top of the hill down to the bottom, 1,600 foot drop. The tram ran for 1,628 feet from the mine to the breaker down a steep incline of 33 degrees, the longest and steepest incline that any tram ever ran in Colorado. So situate things. Here's the mine. All the buildings held, they had 20, 30 buildings where people lived outside of the mine. And then you come right to the mine opening and that tramway goes 1,628 feet all the way down to the bottom. And the coal is then loaded into a tipple and from the tipple, it goes into a Denver and Rio Grande Railroad car and then is shipped out. Anthracite coal, primarily used for heating. Bituminous coal, primarily used in industry. 
by the year, and incidentally, here are the sizes that they, here are the terms they use for the sizes of the coal. A breaker means you break the coal up into different sizes. Fish, orange, nut, pea, and slack or waste, biggest to the smallest, pea being the smallest. In 1884, the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company, which is called the Colorado Coal and Iron Company at that time, bought out Smith and now owned the anthracite mine. By then, 200 people lived in anthracite, or Smith Hill, which had a post office, school, and library. Life up there was very difficult. And here's some of the things I took out of the paper. Early on the morning of January 31, 1883, an avalanche smashed into one of the boarding houses, killing six and injuring 12. Between 1882 and 1903, when it shut down temporarily, the mine employed 70 miners and turned out an average of 5,000 tons of anthracite coal every month. A tremendous operation. It shut down temporarily in 1903. And then it was sold to the Anthracite Mesa Coal Company. And they ran the mine until 1908. From 1908 to 1913, it didn't operate. By 1914, a fire destroyed the giant breaker. And then the new owner, Frank Buckley, we heard of him, right? Same guy that owned the Buckley Mine coming into Crested Butte. You can still see the old place where the tram ran down. He buys it and builds another breaker and runs the mine again. Another fire of 1923 destroyed the new breaker. But the town and the mine thrived through World War I in the 1920s. The Depression, high transportation costs, and gas and electricity eliminated the mine. Most of the miners left and went to work at the big mine. Now here's something may, some of you people may not know. The huge slack coal dump by the breaker, thought to be worthless by locals, was bought by the Empire Zinc Company and the American Smelting and Refining Company in the early 1940s, 400,000 tons at a buck and a quarter a ton. 425,000 dollars to the people of Crested Butte. The Anthracite Mesa Coal Company is pretty much owned by the people of Crested Butte. By 19, that was used, incidentally, that slack stuff was used in a steel fluxing process. In 1947, the Crested Butte Anthracite spur was torn up. Rails were taken out. No longer did the Rio Grande run up to anthracite. Enough on anthracite. You tell Divine he should have had his butt here today to hear that information. <laughs> now, we go around the room here. I want to make sure everybody's paying good attention. I think I told you last time we had nine coal mines in and around Crested Butte. So let's start with this table right here and give me one through nine. Just give me one mine. Buckley. Buckley Mine. Big Mine. Big Mine. I have no idea. Jokerville. Jokerville Mine. Uh, Any help? Pershing. Pershing Mine. What's next to the Pershing Mine right by that lake out in the lower loop? Peanut. Peanut Mine. What's the mine 11 miles west of Crested Butte? Floresta. Floresta. We got any other mines? Coming into Crested Butte, Robinson Mine, and the Horace Mine. Big mine, I mean Pueblo Mine. Yeah, Pueblo Mine. Pueblo Mine, I think, and the Horace Mine. Are the, when I was, that was Pueblo Mine. Yeah, I think it had a couple different names. I think it was also called Littell and Horace, but I'm not sure. But Pueblo Mine, I think you're right. So there are the eight great mines. Now what we're going to do, how, how are we doing on time? 20, okay, we got a little more time. We are now going to work our way 
up from Crested Butte, up the Slate River. We've just gone by Anthracite, and we now move to a town that is known initially as Tucson, later known as OB Joyful. And we've all been to the OB Joyful waterfalls, of course. You can go all the way up. Now, the interesting thing about it is the OB Joyful area never turned a damn thing out. It was practically worthless. So it shouldn't have been called OB Joyful. Keep that in mind. Originally known as Tucson. Five cabins connected to Crested Butte by Good Wagon Road. The name of the mines in the area, Argo, Spar Chief, Little Annie, Yankee, Blade. Now we're moving north out of Obi Joyful, and about four miles further, we come to a town called Hidalgo. And Hidalgo is located right where Poverty Gulch runs into the Slate River. And it's located in the year 1881. Hopefully, going to be a great mining area. 100 men lived in dozens of tents and two log cabins. It lasted one year and was replaced as we move another half mile beyond Hidalgo, where the two rivers join, one half mile up to Pittsburgh. No H, as in Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh was a very interesting area half mile north of the junction of Poverty Gulch and the Slate River. In 1881, while Hidalgo was still operating, it had 50 men in a post office and one of the greatest mines in the history of the Gunnison country, certainly in the top eight. Anybody know the name of that mine up there, Poverty Gulch? Augusta. The Augusta Mine. Very good. The Augusta Mine. Tremendous mine. Initially, the ore had to be taken by wagon to the railroad at Anthracite. So you take it from Augusta by wagon all the way down to Poverty Gulch and junction of the Slate River, and then you've got to take that thing all the way down to Anthracite and load it on the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad and ship the ore out. In January of 1886, Three men died when a big avalanche took out the boarding house at the Excelsior Mine. That's another mine. It was located right next to the Augusta and also a pretty good one. Were these silver mines? Silver or silver? Yeah, silver. Primarily silver, yeah. In 1904, because of continuous avalanches, nine men got scared, left the Augusta Mine and started for Crested Butte on skis. One mile below the mine, they were hit by a massive avalanche, killing six of the nine. Remember when I told you that, I mean, avalanches, you know, and I, heartbroken, that the Mason boy, of course, it was no avalanche, he, he died at the ski area, but in avalanches, we lose one person in an avalanche today in Colorado, it's front page news. In those days... Hell, they probably lost in Colorado 50 or 60 in the state of Colorado every year minimum. No publicity at all, or hardly any publicity. Now, in the year 1886, an aerial tram came from the Augusta Mine to near Poverty Gulch, a drop of 1,500 feet one and a half miles long, wiped out by avalanches the first year. With the development of the Augusta Mine, Pittsburgh now began to boom in the 1880s. 200 people, daily transportation to Crested Butte, sawmill, two merchandise stores, two boarding houses, 25 cabins and four saloons, post office, assay office. And then came the panic of 1893, and people left and the post office closed down. And then after 1893, a mill was built in Poverty Gulch below the Augusta. Power was generated through a four-inch pipe, which ran nearly 5,000 feet above Augusta 
to the Augusta and Black Queen mines. Water running downhill, obviously, creates power. This enabled power drills to be used in the new tunnels of the Augusta. In 1908, another tram was built from the mill down towards Poverty Gulch. This tram ran for 3,980 feet and had six towers. Buckets carried 10 tons an hour. At one point, buckets were 300 feet in the air. You know, I, I tell you, I, I wish I could have had one month here in the 1880s. Isn't that unbelievable? Two aerial trams out of the Augusta. Taylor Park is even more unbelievable. They had a powerhouse so big at the Enterprise Mine, it lit up all of Taylor Park. In 1909, an avalanche destroyed the Augusta Mine buildings and part of the tram. That ended Poverty Gulch and Pittsburgh, but not before one million dollars of silver had been taken out of the Augusta mine at one buck an ounce. Today in the New York Stock Exchange, I think I looked, it sold for almost 12. So by today's prices, 12 million dollars came out of the Augusta mine. Now before we leave today, as we leave Pittsburgh, one of, my, one of my favorite mountain bike trips of all time is to go from Crested Butte all the way up to the top of Paradise Divide and then ride my bike down the headwaters of the Slate on the road all the way down with that magnificent canyon on the right. It's almost a religious experience coming down the damn thing. So as we make our way now north out of Pittsburgh, we got all those zigzags on the road going up, and the next thing we come up to is the top of Paradise Divide at 11,200 feet. And if you go to the right, you're going to go to the town of Elko, and you're going to go to Schofield Pass, or you're going to go into Schofield Park. If you go to the left, you are going over a fantastic pass that we'll start with next time, known as Yule Pass. 11,200 feet, which had the Elk Mountain Railroad all set to run. They had it graded out and everything when things hit the skids. You can still see telegraph poles off on the side. Now, I'd love to have seen that railroad. <laughs> that would have been one hell of a railroad, and with that, I bid you adieu. <laughs> We're out of here. Oh, question. You know, you do all this stuff about skiing all the time, and I would like, if you wouldn't mind next week, doing something about the amazing coaching you did at Western oh, State. Oh, I don't do that, hell. This is Crested Butte history, not me. I know, but I'd still like to hear it sometime. Uh, I'll give you 30 seconds, how's that? <laughs> now, Faust, what are you going to do for me? Can you type it out? I want, now this, I'm not kidding now, I'm not kidding. Yeah. I, want it, I want it all done for me nicely, and you know, where you were born, how you grew up, how you got into skiing, when you came to Crested Butte, okay. and your performances. All right. Okay? Sounds good. Western State I'm, I'm, I'm counting on you, buddy. Right, buddy. 